A university as an institution is a host of critics. It's a host to critics. It is not a critic. And institutions shouldn't be taking positions on uh, uh, issues. And so demands that the institution, extra, I, I think it undermines the distinctive function of uh, universities and there was too much position taking by a lot of institutions for a number of years. Hey there, Josh Cohen. How are you? I- I'm well, Glenn. I'm sitting here at a cabin in the woods in Maine. Um, that's why you. Huh. That's why there's all that wood in the background. Oh, How here in the late spring, that's a good place to be. It's um, a everybody, day so here. you know, this is. Gl- yeah, I'm sorry, Josh. No, just I'm here for a I was a just wedding. going to introduce us. Go ahead. Yeah. Glenn Lowry here. You've tuned into The Glenn Show. Uh, Glenn Show is sponsored by the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research in New York City. I'm a professor at Brown University, and I'm joined uh, this week by Josh Cohen, a political philosopher who is a professor at uh, Apple University and an adjunct faculty at the UC Berkeley Law School, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he's also publisher, co-publisher with uh, Deb Chasman of the Boston Review magazine, which is a high tone literary and political periodical yeah. that I have contributed to in years past. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Josh is here to talk about this and that. Uh, the topic of the day, war in Gaza, free speech in America uh, and everything else in between. Josh and I are old friends. In fact, yeah. I should say, Josh is responsible for my career as a podcaster because yeah. he introduced me to Robert Wright and Blogging Heads way, way back when. Uh, that was 15, 18 years ago, something like that. Well, I, I found the original email introducing you uh, to uh, Robert Wright, Glenn. It was from uh, July 2007. Uh, and uh, then we started. Oh, my doing- God. Yeah, yeah, 17 years ago, uh, almost, and uh, we were doing blogging heads for a while, including uh, uh, lots of wonderful conversations, but at least for me, maybe most memorably on uh, election night 2008, and we were doing a blogging heads conversation when we called the election for, uh, well, the election was called for Barack Obama, Uh, that seems like... uh, eons ago that was a different era (laughs) it was a different era and uh, anyway it's such a pleasure to see you and be uh uh, back with you it's been it's been a while and uh i'm grateful for the opportunity uh to do it Um, you were just saying as we were uh chatting before we began the recording that you somehow gotten your hands on a copy of late admissions Confessions of a Black Conservative, my new memoir just out from Norton. Yeah. Uh, I I not only have, I may be the only person who owns it in all three versions. I mean, the Audible is not out yet, but I have it on order and it'll be dropped. At, but I had a Kindle, I got a Kindle version of it and I got a hardback version of it. And I've already read uh, every single word of it uh, with great, I couldn't uh, honestly. I, I I I couldn't put it down. I thought it was amazing. Um, Thanks, Josh. Uh, really, um, uh, and I, I I don't know. There are lots of moments in it that I found you know particularly interesting and arresting. For some reason, and I don't know what this is. Maybe it says something about me, or it's really odd. The the, the there was this story that you tell about a conversation with Dick Eckhaus, who's an economist at uh, one of, the... At, late, uh, the late Richard he, Eckhaus. Late, uh, he passed yeah. away a year ago or so. Yeah. And um, you're in a conversation with him, and the conversation, I guess, is about, uh, among other things, about Paul Samuelson and how Paul Samuelson had ended up at MIT because of kind of anti-Semitism at uh, Harvard, and they didn't want uh, Paul Samuelson around. And Dick Ackhouse said to you, you know, Glenn, there were two things about Paul Samuelson. The first is, yeah, there was this anti-Semitism stuff. The second is that he acted like an asshole, and he pissed off a <laughs> lot of people. 
And you didn't have to be an anti to find this guy. You know, he was a smarty pants. He was really irritating. And the reason that Dick, How- Dick Eckhouse said that to you, as you tell the story, is he was saying to you, don't be like Paul. <laughs> don't give people more excuses for not taking you, uh, not wanting you around. Is that uh, a fair? I, I, I love that you like that story. I mean, what he said, uh, I can remember it specifically. He said, uh, Paul didn't suffer fools gladly. And some of those fools were 50 year old full professors of economics at Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> and he was yeah. a 20 something uh, whippersnapper. Uh, he yeah. also said, he said, uh, he, he told me, you know, you're an extraordinary talent and some people are going to have difficulty dealing with that talent. You bear the obligation of managing a circumstance. Don't gratuitously offend them. Yeah. I thought Don't that was pretty good excuse. advice. Exactly. Yeah, it was it, it was pretty good advice. But I, do you think you followed that advice? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. That's why I like the story. I thought it was good advice, but I I'm glad you didn't follow it. I'm I'm actually I think to your credit that you uh uh that you didn't follow it. And 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 that'll uh, ultimately uh, play into the one of the themes in the conversation today about uh, issues about uh, self uh, about self censorship. I, d- I did w- w- want just uh, to mention uh, I, we talked about this. We were originally going to do this conversation yesterday, but uh, my uh, mother in law was in her final days, and uh, uh, we I was in the place where she had been living for some time, and then she passed uh, yesterday. Uh, and, oh, my condolences and, to you and, and Ellen. That, that's your wife's name, isn't Ellen. it? Yes, and, yeah. and Ellen. Yeah, uh, uh, she was surrounded by loved ones and uh, went pretty people so at 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 age one hundred and two. Um, so a very long and uh, and uh, rich life, including that she was uh, Natalie Aronson Eisen uh, was a pediatrician and uh, and uh, uh, she and. Um, her husband, Ellen's father, my late father-in-law, lived in uh, uh, in, in Boston, in Newton, and and, and uh, she was a pediatrician, and uh, so she went to NYU Medical School in the 1940s, late 40s, and there were not a lot of women in her medical school classes, you could imagine, so she was a kind of uh, an pioneer. unusual and uh, a pioneer, an extraordinary person, and uh, and also not unrelated to our the theme, one of the uh, some of the themes of the conversation today. She, as I also mentioned to you, her uh, grandfather had been uh, a, a rabbi in pre-mandate Palestine. So in a couple of towns in uh, pre-mandate Palestine in the very earliest years of the uh, 20th century. Um, and uh, anyway, she was a remarkable person and uh, she was surrounded by uh loved ones uh and passed uh peacefully at uh, around noon yesterday so yeah uh what did you make of the conviction of Donald Trump on 34 felonious counts in the uh New York City that came down yesterday or the day before um, I, you know, I can't, I, I don't have a kind of celebratory view of this, uh, for a couple of different reasons. First of all, it's, it's awful when, a you know, a, a, a you know, a person who's president and may end up being president again is, uh, Convicted of uh, you know, of thirty four uh, felonies, um, and and I also think uh, that the uh, it, it it doesn't discredit him with his uh, supporters, and no. uh, the the final, for better or worse, the ultimate judgment is going to be uh, on you know in November on election the election. Uh, I can't stand him. I think he's horrible. Uh, but I, but I, but I, I don't, and, but I don't feel any glee or 
celebration, sense of celebration about this. I think it's an awful thing about the, you know, parlous state of the country. And, and also, uh, I, I think it's awful. I do think it's awful that lots of, uh, is, you know, co-partisans, co Republicans are uh, treating this just as, you know, yet another example of a politically, you know, some politically motivated trial and conviction. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Sh- I, I, but it, it is, a, it, it, it was a politically motivated trial, was it not? I mean, uh, Alvin Bragg campaigned on the promise to, to get Trump in so many words and, uh, you know, I, I saw a piece from Michael Lind uh, this morning, yeah. uh, where he says this is, uh, in its way as bad for American democracy as was January 6th, maybe even worse. It's a terrible precedent. Uh, we haven't heard the last of this kind of uh, thing, and it's just not good for the institutions over the longer term, whatever you might think of Trump. And he doesn't think much of Trump. So. Yeah. Uh, that may be right. Uh, obviously, there's something. Uh, all of that, uh, but um, and of course there is prosecutorial discretion. Um, but then there is this question, and I wonder what was he guilty of thirty four felonies or not? And if he was guilty of thirty four felonies, is it really terrible that he was convicted? of those uh, 34 felonies and isn't it plausible to think i mean it's maybe it's not right but the you know there was a jury and they listened to a case including one person who said one member of the jury who said that his source of news is truth social that's his sole source of news i don't, I don't know who the members of the jury were but uh, uh they judged that he had committed these uh felonies including uh, and this was obviously was at stake in the case, uh, um, you know, misreporting a bunch of payments for the purpose of uh, hiding other, you know, conduct, including uh, keeping it out of the public eye in the for the election. So I don't know. Do you think it's what do you think of that? I mean, I, it's it, well, it's I think horrible. he was guilty. I mean, he was guilty, horrible. but. He was guilty by yeah. definition, and it is prosecutorial discretion. And I ask myself the question, would this case have been brought against somebody who wasn't named Donald Trump? Uh, yeah. To which my answer is no, clearly it would not have been. Uh, and I worry what that implies yeah. about the yeah. kind of degradation of the integrity of institutions on, on behalf of yeah. partisan political gain. And, yeah. uh, you know, two can play at this game, and I don't know that we want to live yeah. in the world in which uh, this is a uh, a regular uh, course of events for political competition. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I agree with all of that. What I uh, but uh, my understanding is that prosecutions prosecutions for this kind of activity are not uncommon. I, I don't so I don't know. I mean, a key f- assertion that you make there, which may well be true. I I don't know. Neither do you. We don't know. We're no, don't, a little no. out over our skis here, but but. Uh, would he have been prosecuted for this if his name weren't Donald Trump? And I, I, I think that's a I, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I do think that there are. This is like you know bread and butter stuff for the uh, for this uh, for these prosecutors. So maybe maybe he would have. I don't know, um, uh, but but it's bad that he did the stuff and if you didn't you i think you would also probably agree that if you didn't prosecute him because his because his name was donald trump the flip side suppose you said look we you know this is you know there are very heavy uh, risks here we shouldn't prosecute him then what you're doing is freeing somebody from the legal obligations that the rest of us are subject to. Yeah, sure. No one is above, their, above the law. I, I certainly agree with that. No one is the above law. the law. Yeah. So it's a, I, I think my um, scientific summary of this is it's a shit show. <laughs> That's, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's horrible. And I don't want to be at all dismissive of the, you know, the idea that this was a politically motivated uh, uh, 
prosecution. And I don't want to be dismissive of the idea that it was a politically motivated prosecution of politically motivated felonious conduct. Okay. Isn't that... Is, yeah. That, yeah. That's a plausible position as far as I can tell. I mean... Yeah. Uh, I don't does not like seem- people who are celebrating this. I don't like celebration. So we're at one, I, I think, there's nothing to celebrate here. Yeah. We got an election coming up, Josh. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Trump looks like he's ahead. Yeah. Notwithstanding all of this. Notwithstanding all of this. And... Um, what do you make of that? Uh, um, there's I in in some moods. This is I suppose this. I'll, I'll put my most optimistic spin on it, which is. Um, just make it real bread and butter. Uh, you know, inflation, particularly in the first two years of the Biden administration, ran pretty high, not higher than in other uh, countries in Western Europe, but it ran pretty high and it ran ahead of uh, wage gains. And so the uh, mix of wage gains and high uh, and you know record level you know employment uh, and some interesting bipartisan legislation just doesn't loom as large for people uh, you know understandably as the fact that there has been this erosion of uh, earnings with uh, from inflation and that this is at least to some extent the uh, the troubles that Biden has uh, come from that i should add one other thing about biden which is you know, I know a lot of people who like Biden. I kind of like Biden. Biden has never been a particularly popular politician. I mean, he was successful from an early rage as senator in Delaware. He ran in 88 and he got run out of town because he was plagiarizing from Neil Kinnock's speeches. Uh, he tried again in 2008 and, you know, he, I, nobody even remembers that. I mean, he was, and then he was not doing so well in 2020 initially, till South Carolina. And he basically won, I think, in 2020 because everybody else was running to his left. And they, you know, kind of canceled each other out. And uh, so somebody who's never been a particular, po- particularly popular politician isn't, uh, it's kind of a return to baseline uh, for him. And I think those two things, and this is not a, you know somebody who people celebrate, and uh, and and then the the stuff about uh, uh, in, you know the persistence of uh, in, inflation. I think um, I mean I could make up nastier stories, but I, I'll, I'll let, I don't know. Well, what do you about, think? Well, I mean I think he's a singularly uninspiring figure, uh, Joseph Robinette yeah. Biden. Yeah. Uh, I don't disagree with anything you said about his history. Uh, I, I think his uh, command of the country's attention as our uh, chief uh, political officer and yeah. uh, figurehead of uh, leadership is you know, uninspiring is the word that comes to mind. And, you know, he's not getting yeah. any younger. He's not getting any more cogent. He's not getting any more eloquent. He's not getting any more inspiring. So... Uh, we'll see what comes out of these debates. I, 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 I was intrigued that he, you know, latched on to the debate, early debate idea. I think that's a signal that he knows he's uh, in pretty difficult straits and, and needs something to shake the, shake things up. But yeah. um, I mean, ultimately, I'm not a big fan you know, of Joe Biden. I'm shocked to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. Um, um, I, I, I I guess I said I kind of like him. I like him. Okay, I like him more than you do. I don't. 
I don't find him a particularly inspiring figure. I just, I think Trump is uh, a loathsome uh, enemy of uh, a whole bunch of really fundamental political values, political and human values. I think he's a loathsome uh, anti-democratic uh, I I do think, and I know I'm, I'm mindful of the person I'm talking with when I use this term, but I also think he has a history of being a racist. I think his Central Park Five views, uh, still sitting on it, I think that was uh, um, uh, inexcusable. I think he's, uh, you know, com- to, you know uh, tr- to trivialize it all, he's a complete... Uh, uh, narcissist uh and i don't think the plans that he's got this time around are uh particularly attractive to the country i don't um so i i think he's an enemy of fun really ground level fundamental political val an enemy of and a threat to really ground level fundamental political values now, what about all of these people who support him and who see him as a, a tribune, who are uh, furious with the elites who've been governing them uh, yeah. for the last generation or so, and for whom yeah. Trump is a spokesperson? What, what about all the anti-woke people, all the people who resist the, the uh, whatever the latter-day uh, yeah. pro- progressive, uh, you know, of enthusiasm might be, uh, and and uh, who are going to vote for Trump no matter what, no matter how many times he gets convicted in a New York City uh, courtroom. What about them? That's half the country. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think that there is a lot of uh, entirely rightful and righteous anger uh, at uh, the way country has been managed um for the you know run by political elites for uh you know several uh decades uh now i think uh you know i I mean just to take you know the 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 simplest example and again you know the um, issues about uh kind of what danny roger calls hyper globalization uh Always hyper globalization with uh, arguments about how uh, you can uh, give side payments to people to buffer them against the shocks of you know globalization, and the side payments are never made, um, and uh, so people got hurt really, really badly. And so I think there are lots of people who uh, are pissed off and right and right to be pissed off. I, I wish there was a better vehicle for that anger uh, than, uh, than, uh, than Trump. Did you read uh, Michael Sandel's book of a few years ago, uh, Tyranny of Merit? Uh, I, I, I've read, it, it, I, I've read at it. Uh, I haven't, oh. you've you put me in an embarrassing position. I have not read it carefully. He did publish a, a piece of it in uh, Boston Review, but I, I've read some of it. What, what, what's your, what did you? Well, no, I, I'm just remembering uh, his, uh, the argument that he makes there about how you have winners and losers from globalization or whatever it might be. And when the winners go around crowing based on a meritocratic, development. I got a PhD. I, I know how to write code. I'm, I'm a part of the modern world. And all you're doing is yeah. pumping gas or, you know, fixing uh, broken down cars or uh, doing carpentry somewhere. And, you know, I'm doing fine. Thank you. And I earned it and I deserve it. He says the invocation of the meritocratic defense of privilege is indirectly a statement to the people who are lagging behind that they earned their a poor position as well, or yeah. failed to earn a better position, and that there's no grounding for a politics politics of solidarity and shared fate, yeah. and that and that's really very bad in the long run. I thus stated, I completely agree with that. 
I mean, there are lots of people. And, and he even who were, he even invokes Trump. He he says to some degree this helps to explain why it is that a guy like Donald Trump could get so much traction with a poorly educated or working class population. Yeah, um, I, I I that's a fancier version of what I was uh, you know trying to uh, trying to get at. I left out the meritocratic beats, which is. Uh, it's not only an issue about the distribution of benefits and burdens, it's an issue about the justification for those benefits yeah. and burdens. And there are lots of people who, uh, as uh, Ann Richards said about uh, George Bush, uh, you know, were born on third base and they think that they hit a triple. It's not, And born on third base, not because they were born wealthy, but be, because they were born at the right place at the right time with the right upbringing and, 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 you know, and, you know, maybe the right, uh, native, uh, talents. Uh, right. but, um, I, I'm a, as you know, I'm a, a, a Rawlsian on issues about native talents. I think they are, uh, from a moral point of view, from the standpoint of political morality contingencies, uh, and they sh- don't, any more than the social background, uh, I don't think that they provide a basis for uh, claims to, you know, the uh, benefits and burdens, except insofar as getting those benefits and burdens, because you've got the native talents, contributes to the uh, well-being of others. And in the Rawlsian formulation, not only the well-being, but the maximal well-being of, uh, and so I, I think uh, I I think there's a huge amount of uh, righteous, r- rightful and righteous uh, anger. And I think one of the things be- that's been a problem, and I've talked to uh, people who are, you know, uh, figures in the Democratic Party about this, is that there's not been anyone prominent who has been willing to say about the Clinton Obama legacy, what Trump said about the mainstream Republican legacy. And it's the source of a, you know, bad. It's a source of uh, problems. There's been not, you know, even Bernie Sanders, it's a a little bit, but, you know, nobody has said about Clinton and Obama what Trump said about Bush. And I think that's a problem. Okay. I'm sorry, Glenn. I'm agreeing with you too much. We've got to get to some place. <laughs> I mean, even though we're in very different, you know, we land in very different places. But, you know, when, let, let me just, uh, when, uh, when Barack Obama said, made the comment about people clinging to their you know, their guns and their religion, or when Hillary Clinton said basket of deplorables. Yeah. That is the crystallization of this malignant sensibility that you're uh, describing. You know, as people say, they, you know, said the quiet stuff out loud. And I, it, people are pissed off about it. They're right to be pissed off. Trump is just a hideous, disgusting, degraded vehicle for those profoundly serious and legitimate concerns. That's what I... Okay. Let's talk (laughs) about Gaza. Yeah. Let's talk about college demonstrations all over the country. Let's talk about Ivy League presidents deposed from their... uh, from their... uh, positions because of the way in which they responded to congressional committees. Let's yeah. talk about free speech and the uh, efforts to label as an anti-Semite anybody who disagrees on uh, the foreign policy question of this yeah. war. Yeah. yeah. Let's So um, you uh, sent me the memo that you wrote about your experience uh, talking to a uh, synagogue in Palm Beach. Yeah, uh, let me just mention, this uh, talk yeah. that we're having now will go up for subscribers on Monday, the 3rd of June. 
on Sunday, the 2nd of June, which is tomorrow, uh, I'm going to post the, the memo that you saw from me in which I reflect yeah. on my uh, experience yeah. at that synagogue and related questions about the atmosphere that we're in for yeah. voicing opinion about the conflict in Gaza uh, and yeah. uh, how it is uh, to some degree taking your reputation in your hands to uh, pretty much say anything about it. Uh, one side or the yeah. other will uh, condemn yeah. you for this or that. And yeah. uh, the incentives that that creates to just uh, trim your sails and not say what you think and how I find that to be yeah. uh, unacceptable and so on. So I make a, something of a declaration in the statement that was posted on Sunday and people will be hearing us talk about it. And you've seen the statement in advance. Yes. Thanks for, yeah. So um, I read the statement, which will people be having a chance to read. And um, in it, you talk about going to this synagogue and giving a talk about the fractured character of relations between uh, blacks and uh, Jews in the United States. Uh, Let me just mention, Josh, the talk was in January of this year, but the invitation came months before October 7th of 2023. And the topic set for me was to address uh, whatever happened to the partnership between blacks and Jews, that's Americans. Uh, And I did address that subject, but I did not say anything about the conflict in uh, Israel, Gaza, uh, and regretted that I didn't, but didn't because I didn't want to say anything that might offend the sensibility of the congregation. Yeah. And so I, I, I read the statement and I agreed very much with what you said about the conflict in uh, Gaza. Uh, and we can talk about that in a minute. And the, but then you mm-hmm. mention in the statement uh, that you were um, that you didn't say anything about uh, you didn't express these views of yours, and that afterwards you felt ashamed by that. That was the word you used was ashamed. Yeah. And I was really surprised to see that you expressed shame that you hadn't said anything about it. I mean, I thought you would say, I wish I had, but that it was shit. And then I watched, I did actually watch the talk, the statement as it includes ah. a link to the talk. So I watched it this morning. Yeah. And I, I have to say that after I watched it, I understood better why you felt a sense of shame about it. And I'm saying this with nothing but, you know, affection and admiration. I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, hey, being high-minded about it, but I understood better. But and, tell me why, tell me why. Oh, yeah. So uh, the, the talk is about, you know, what happened to the relation between uh, blacks and Jews. And there's a very nice and moving opening by Paul Lyon, who, along with his wife, I guess, funds these events. And he talks about growing up in the Bronx in a community that was like 99.9999%. Excuse me, that's Paul Levy. I I just want to correct the record. His name is Paul Levy. Paul Levy, sorry, sorry. And, you know, and he talks about, you know, the commitment that the particularly, born in 47, memorable commitment of people in this community to civil rights. And then, you know, relations get more complicated. And so then you are talking about two sources of this fractured relationship between blacks and Jews in the United States. And the first, I was very familiar with your views about this, about affirmative action and DEI and quotas and the uh, the unease among uh, a, a bunch of uh, American Jews, including progressive Jews. I mean, Michael Walzer, for example, about affirmative sure. action. Uh, and then the second source is Israel Palestine. I thought, oh, okay. And then you describe how, and I'm going to simplify this, but I, I, it, I, I don't think m- misleading. Simplify this. It's like 
Israel, basically, you present as kind of an outpost of the West in uh, in in a, in a tough neighborhood. You don't say an outpost of the West as in settler colonialist, but, you know, other people have different languages. But it's an outpost of the West, which is something that you affirmatively identify with. Right. And then you talk about a... Uh, a sensibility, particularly maybe prominent or more prominent, certainly than you like among uh, uh, black, uh, you know, intellectuals or some mm-hmm. elites in the United States, which is a kind of third worldist, anti-colonialist um, sensibility that leads to an identification of the uh, black struggles in the United States with anti-colonialist struggles, and that leads to an identification with the plight of Palestinians. So, is that a fair? That's very fair. That's what, um, and at no point in the whatever it was, seven or eight minutes, or at the whole talk was about 20 minutes, at no point in the talk did you say anything, did you express any misgivings at all about the conduct of the war, in the me- which in the memo you describe as not uh, a genocide, but uncomfortably close to it. But you didn't say any of that in the thing. And then I thought, if I'm in the audience there and I hear what Glenn Lowry is saying with characteristic eloquence and intellectual power, and there's nothing about that. What it left, what I think I would come away with from that is that you have no criticism of the war. So the self-censorship wasn't just, I'm not going to talk about this. The self-censorship, I think, probably left in the minds of a bunch of people in the audience the thought, oh, I see Glenn Lowry agrees with us about this. I mean, I'm making a presumption about the people in the audience that they uh, would resist the views that you express in your memo about this being, you know, a horror and it has to stop and it's a near genocide. And then, and this goes back to your wonderful 1994 paper about the consequences of self-censorship, which is what that does is leave the people who are who are expressing the view views that you have about the conflict critical near genocide. It leaves that in the hands of people who are hostile to, are more, more hostile to Israel, more, in some cases, maybe, I, this is overdone, but in some cases, maybe more plausibly accused of being anti-Semitic than you who, I, 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 there's not an, I can't, I even want to say that there's not an anti-Semitic, you know, you know, m- b- bone or cell in your body. Which is a theme in the 1994, that beautiful 1994 paper of yours about political correctness. So I thought the reason that you're ashamed was that you talked about the topic and didn't say anything about this thing, and that that self censorship it really it was um, uh, left the mis may well have left the misimpression in people's minds that you agreed. Them, and that the only people who really disagree with them are people who are not uh, in any way aligned with their values and concerns. Something like that. Does that is that a fair? I, I think that's an astute observation. Uh, it fits well with the logic of my argument in that essay, which is basically a signaling argument. People don't know what you think, yeah. but they come to conclusions about what you think based on what you say. And if the people who have complex and nuanced views, uh, which include perhaps criticism of Israel's conduct of the war in the case at hand, don't speak, then the only ones who will be engaged in that criticism are going to be people with 
relatively extreme uh, views that uh, are not necessarily creditable. Uh, but that then makes it even harder for anybody who has nuanced views to speak out because they'll be identified with the extremes and that becomes an equilibrium. Yeah. That, that kind of thing. And yeah. that certainly is part of it. I mean, I, I had set myself up to have a colloquy with the congregation about this sensitive matter, but I blinked uh, or I choked or I, I held my tongue. And part of the shame comes from knowing that that's a socially uh, unproductive way to conduct my office as a social critic. But part of it comes from knowing that the motives uh, for my uh, reticence were ones of uh, concern that I'd engender a backlash in certain quarters that would be, you know, unpleasant or even harmful to my, my, you know, professional and personal, you know. I mean, I, I go to a dinner party and my friend, I won't name my friend, my friend who is Jewish and who is a... Uh, fervent Zionist, and there's nothing wrong with that. Some of my best friends are Zionists, and, uh, you know, uh, I don't talk to my friend about what I think about what's going on. I mean, in an interest of avoiding, in the interest of avoiding conflict and damage to our relationship, but what kind of friendship is that, that we can't actually talk about these matters? And he gets not to know that his dear friend, whom he admires for many reasons, may disagree with him about this or that, and that the tension of that disagreement is produ- pr- potentially productive and maybe even nurturing of the friendship in the long run, but yeah. it, it has to be tested and it requires yeah. courage. And on that particular occasion, I did not exhibit the courage that I thought was called for. I was ashamed of that. What do you think you could have said in that context? Because this is... It just, there's a related set of issues here about the nature of this kind of presentation, which where you're trying to, it's not just a profession of faith. This is what I think. I mean, you're trying to engage people and you know, they think similarly in some ways different from you in other ways. You're engaged in an act of public engagement and discussion, not personal statement of faith. So what do you think you could have said in that? occasion that okay something like look i'm your friend not your enemy i have great admiration for the project uh which is uh, manifest in the establishment and of the state of israel and the uh aspirations of the jewish people but that is coming with a cost it's a political problem for which there's only a political solution. Even people like me who are basically on your side are, get, are made to chafe and recoil uh, at the cost that's being borne by people who really didn't do anything to deserve it. Yeah. Uh, and you need to know uh, that, uh, uh, again, notwithstanding the basic uh, affiliation and affirmation that uh, a person like me would want to make. Some of us are, are having uh, qualms here and more than qualms. And some of us are recoiling in disgust at what we see. And some of us are losing faith in the integrity of this project that uh, we admire and, and that is historically an imperative. And the politics of this situation needs to move, you know, two-state solution, whatever you want to call yeah. it. But there's got to be some uh, uh, space given to uh, the humanity and uh, the legitimacy of the aspirations of, of the Palestinian uh, uh, Arabs who are under your uh, uh, dominion. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'm in your corner, kind of, but not uncritically so, not, not without reservation, uh, not without qualm, not without a, 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 a sense of uh, foreboding uh, that yeah. uh, you're on a slippery slope to a very bad place. Yeah. Something I, like that. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 here's what what I think is compli- and complicated and interesting about this and uh, about the nature of public discussion, public engagement. And and again, I'm uh, ex- this is in the spirit of exploration and uh and 
I, I don't mean just trying to understand, not just trying to understand what was in your mind, but trying to understand uh, engagement around uh, issues like this, or maybe there there is no issue that's at this point quite like this, which is what you just said is not that different from the kind of things that Tom Friedman has been saying. Um, I mean, I'm not a big fan of Tom Friedman's. I'm not an assiduous reader of Tom Friedman's, but I've been reading him over the past six months on this issue. And, you know, I think he's kind of reasonable and sensible. I don't, it's not a matter of agreeing or disagreeing. I just think he's made, say, voicing things like this. Or Senator Schumer says Netanyahu should step aside. And among other reasons, Netanyahu should step aside uh, because there is, I think maybe Schumer said this, but maybe he could have said there is only one plausible solution to this, which is a two-state solution. And Netanyahu is opposed to that. So there were things, so in the moment, in this situation, uh, there were, there are people who have said things not unlike what you just said, and uh, unless you have some wild idea of what it means to be an anti-Semite or anti-Israel or anti-Zionist, you know, and you think Tom Friedman is, you know, an anti-Semite or Chuck Schumer is an anti-Semite, I then you're uh, hopeless. But but th those there are those kinds of things. And so why I'm why what is it about this issue or your circumstances, who you are, um, uh, and that led you to, not to think? Well, I can't. You know, I I can't go there, and I can't even invoke these. Um, but I, and I'm asking this partly because I feel a, a lot of reticence on this issue. I don't have an expert knowledge of it, and I am cautious, more cautious and hesitant than on other issues. And I'm looking for help here. I'm not. <laughs> what, what? Why couldn't you have said? Well, as, yeah. Let, let, let me just say for the record, I've communicated with the organizers at uh, the synagogue, which invited me to give that address. Yeah. I appreciate that you took time to listen to what I had to say there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I shared with them the statement that I posted uh, oh, Sunday, yeah. the 2nd of June, uh, about this whole matter. And they said, man, I wish you had spoken your mind. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No problem. We don't expect everybody to agree with everything. No problem. And if you want to come back and have a debate with, oh, uh, Douglas Murray or some other prominent uh, pro-Zionist uh, voices about this matter, we're happy to invite you back and to, uh, to host that debate and let the chips fall where they may. They said, what? What, the, what? what are you worried about? It's okay, man. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so... Now, I, I do have to acknowledge that some of my uh, sensitivity about exposing myself, as I have just done, and uh, as I do in the statement that uh, we put up on the 2nd of June, yeah. some of my sensitivity comes from reading the comments at my uh, newsletter and, you know, in my Substack when I, when I had John Mearsheimer uh, on, you know who John Mearsheimer is, of course. I, I, he's a friend, yeah, I uh, great respect. Uh, well, I had him on, and he was talking mostly about uh, uh, Ukraine, not about Gaza. But uh, yeah. he, he's been very, very outspoken about uh, yeah. Israel, Gaza, and uh, uh, he's he's uh, not uh, a friend of uh, of the current Israeli government or of the you know uh, uh, of the Zionist project. I think you'd have to say that uh, about Mearsheimer. He, he thinks Israel is in trouble. He, he thinks it's dragging the U.S. down in terms of global opinion about what's going on. So, uh, I had Omer Bartov, uh, the historian. Mm -hmm. You may not know him, but he is a historian of the Holocaust. He's a Israeli, and uh, he's been very, very critical of the Israel's conduct of the its relationship on the West Bank and in uh, Gaza and so on. Yeah. And then the feedback that I get in the comments of people who are tearing into me and have a long list of 
voices on the other side that, Glenn, I would wish that you would do this or that. And, you know, it, it makes me feel like this is a third rail type issue and I'd be best to avoid it altogether or to sit back and let the two sides have at each other and not to have any opinion what, whatsoever. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, in, in fairness, uh, you could have had other, I mean, I like John Mearsheimer. I've, you know, read lots of his work. I, uh, don't, uh, always uh, agree with him. Although I do share a pretty strong, you know, anti-interventionist, uh, sensibility. Uh, I mean, John was calling for an end to the bombing in Afghanistan in December 20, uh, 2001. I mean, before anybody else. So, but there were other people who you could have had who would have said, expressed great hesitations about uh, the Israel's uh, conduct of, of the war who don't come with everything that uh, uh, John comes with and who frankly, and, and also maybe to the point, know a lot more about um, the... Uh, conflict than, than he does. I mean, he's operating from very pretty, you know, he knows a bunch of stuff about things, but he generally operates from pretty abstract uh, principles yeah. about foreign policy and uh, the conduct of uh, uh, foreign uh, foreign affairs. But it's, it's, it's the thing that you mentioned about the, the response of the people in the, that you sent it to in the, in, in, in the synagogue and is, is really, um, uh, interesting because I think it, um, I, 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 I think it raises an issue about the nature of self-censorship that I don't think is in your 1994 piece. So this, the, the, uh, 1994 article is fantastic. It's on political, uh, correctness and it's got a kind of, you know, variant, uh, you, of ideas that you, you talk about uh, Irving Goffman in it and uh, the self-censorship as a kind of signal, as you said, as a kind of signaling uh, equilibrium. One of my colleagues at Boston Review, Matt Lord, who's a few generations younger than uh, uh, we are and who's a brilliant, uh, po he's a po he's polymath, he's a fantastic. I mean, he loves, I mean, he doesn't like he loves that article and he circulates it around to people all the time. This is the best thing out there. I mean, it's really uh, terrific. But most of the focus, if I remember correctly in the article, is about how um, people, censor, uh, people censor themselves um, and the... Um, the concern is that if that if uh, you'll be marginalized, there's a group of people you maybe broadly speaking are aligned with, but you say certain things and they'll think, oh, you're not one of us. And so you don't yeah. say them. So it only leaves the people who are really not in the club saying, making the critical comments. Um, and That's it. I don't, just, if, I, if I remember, there's not a lot in the piece about what is something that you just pointed to, which is a misunderstanding on the part of the speaker about the likely response of the audience. So you didn't say it because your expectation was that they'd say, get the fuck, what do you get out of here? You're not coming to, you know, this is horrible. And you were, so you self-censored, it could be that they had responded that way, and then, but you self-censored as it were, um, unnecessarily. I mean, it didn't have the desire, because they would have, that they say, maybe they're full of shit, but anyway, I, I don't, not that I think they are, but you had a mistaken impression about how your comments would be received. And how much self-censorship, this is a, a question I don't I've never really thought about. That how much self censorship comes from people having mistaken impressions about how the will be received? What do you think? I think that's such an interesting idea, Josh. It's one I've never actually thought about. 
I mean, yeah. I've thought about the idea that the audience's perception of the speaker might be erroneous, thinking the speaker is an anti-Semite when the speaker is really just trying to raise some reasonable questions about, yeah. in the case at hand, the conduct of the uh, war in Gaza. Uh, but I hadn't thought about the idea that the speaker might misunderstand or misanticipate what the audience's reaction would be and not give credit to his audience that they are supple minded enough to be able to yeah. accommodate even disagreement without it leading to a uh, hard feeling or something like that. I mean, you know, that, how, how can you think I'm going to persuade somebody who disagrees with me about something if I presume at the outset that they're only going to uh, yeah. react uh, negatively to what I say? They're not going to listen. They're not going to stop and yeah. think and argue and revisit some of their previous co- preconceptions. I don't give yeah. them that much credit as a speaker when I censor myself because I anticipate their uh, adverse reaction to what I have to say. I don't give them enough credit. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's a fair point. Yeah. I, I want to tell a story about this, and maybe I'll annoy uh, your, the host of this occasion, that is the, uh, Ryan Salam, uh, Manhattan. Uh, Levy, Institute. Paul Levy. No, no, this is a president of Manhattan Institute. You're th- 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 of where you are right now. Isn't, uh, you're at Manhattan Institute, aren't you? Isn't that where you're sitting? I am. I'm affiliated with the Manhattan Institute. I'm the John Paulson Senior Fellow at right. the Manhattan Institute. And Ryan Salam is the president of the Manhattan Institute. Is that right? Ryan Salam is the president of the Manhattan yeah. Institute, my friend Ryan Salam. Yeah, fantastic person. So I want to tell yeah. you a story, which is uh, you came a number of years ago, seven or eight years ago, to the Berkeley workshop that I run, a political theory workshop. We had a great session. Oh, yeah, I we invited that. Ryan. Yeah, it was terrific. We invited Ryan um, when we were doing something on issues about immigration and he said, Yes, uh, it was a little unusual because he's not like sitting in an academic. But that we said, no, no, you've written on this. You're terrific yeah, he's on terrific. this issue. We want he is. So uh, the date is coming, and we're trying to get him to send something, and he's ghosting. And finally, I kind of I said, look, you know, we got, and he expressed some hesitations about coming because he was worried you know, a little worried that he'd come to Berkeley and a bunch of people would uh, defenestrate him or something like that. I mean, it would be a problem. And I said, don't, don't worry about it. If you'd like, I can, you know, involve uh, Erwin Chemerinsky, the law school dean. He will be very committed to uh, ensuring that you have a good and uh, visit or Carol Chris, the provost. He said, no, no, that just is going to make things worse. So I said, okay, <laughs> how about instead, if we, instead of having the session open to the world, we will just make it available to the students who are taking the workshop for credit. And he said, okay, I'll come. So we confined it to those students. And uh, there were uh, uh, people in this group who really disagreed with Ryan and. Uh, some who were whose documentation was <laughs> un- uncertain. It was a fantastic session. It was real. I mean, he's great. He's so funny and interesting and engaging. And people and you know, pe- people. We had a, a great session uh, with him, and that that's an example to me, understandable to be sure, but an example of somebody who. Uh, I think misestimated um, who the people were who he was uh, dealing with, and then but was prepared to jump in, and then things worked out well. And I I wonder, I don't know, what do you think? This is just rank speculation at this point, but do you think that um, uh, that the phenomenon that you saw? in this Palm Beach session of misestimating, you know, by the testimony of people there, misestimating how the audience would have reacted and 
self-censoring for that reason uh, out of a not just an abundance of caution, but a super abundance and excess of caution. Do you think that that's itself an important problem that needs to be addressed? People um, underestimate. I, I don't know, and I'm not sure how I would address it yeah. if I thought. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it underscores the, the importance of trust. Uh, as a as a precondition for effective deliberation, you know that that people feel safe to be able to disagree with each other and uh, things of this kind, and that they yeah. listen, you know. And it, uh, so, but I I don't have a I, I don't yet have a, a fully thought out uh, yeah uh, answer to to your question. Yeah. I'm just stimu I'm stimulated by it because it is something that I didn't think at all about in in the original essay that I wrote. Um, I, and what you say about what are you making trust, of the camp? Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, you go ahead. Do that. Um, I was going to change the subject slightly to yeah, protest yeah. on campus and uh, sit-ins at uh, administration buildings and tent cities on the on the campus quad and uh, all of that and reactions there too. And yeah. wondering how you're. Have you had any uh, pieces at the Boston Review that have uh, dealt with uh, this matter? I'd be surprised if not. I apologize for not knowing the answer in advance. No, we, and, we have. And, and what's, what's your thinking? Good, we've had some very good pieces on the issues about campus protest, and we've also had some very good pieces, including by my old friend and college classmate, Barney Rubin, uh, on, uh, on the conflict uh, itself. Um, Barney wrote of Greg, and we've also had some pieces by some uh, Israelis, uh, uh, you know, who, you know, are uh, profoundly, you know, affected uh, 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 by the issues. I, I think, um, I guess I think, and maybe this is completely misguided, and it goes to the issue that we were just talking about, about what you think about what's going on with other people. Uh, I guess I think that a, to a very large extent, the stuff that happens on, that's happening on campuses is uh, very good. Uh, I'm not talking about, you know, rank anti-Semitism or just the large protests uh, and sustained protests uh, is a good thing. And basically that it comes from people thinking something like what you say in your statement. And it, it's really about the what's morally unacceptable about the conduct of the war, the number of lives, including lo mostly lives of innocent uh, people uh, that have been taken as a result of this war with no uh, well-defined uh, endpoint or plausible strategy for achieving the endpoint. And then it gets wrapped in, you know, these slogans that, you know, get become the prominent story, you know, river to the sea, Palestine shall be free, et cetera, or people jumping way out over their skis about two states or one state who know, you know, who are not experts uh, on the issue. It's another point. Thing. But I guess I'm prepared to regard all of that as the trappings for um, people just experiencing a sense of horror rightly about what's happening and thinking it has to stop and then right. if you ask people how the answer is the same one that we gave in the vietnam protest it's the one you just gave i don't know i didn't get us into this you you figure out how to do it i don't i'm just telling you that this is not within the bounds of uh, acceptability that's that, that's yeah. my and then, you know, a bunch of, I guess the one thing, anyway, d does that make, 
Th- that requires not taking literally or at face value a lot of stuff that gets said and reported. And but uh, well, it it I'm invites me not. to distinguish between between the motivations of uh, the kids, uh, the young people for protesting, uh, which is their identification with the humanity of the uh, Palestinians who are being victimized, the innocents, and so on. Distinguish between the motivations on the one hand, a horror, recoiling in horror, shock, and disgust at the loss of life and at the barbarity of this thing. War is ugly and terrible, and they hate it, and they want us to know that. On the one hand, and maybe some of the methods that are employed uh, on the other, which can go over the line and, you know, you disrupt the uh, normal uh, functioning of the university on behalf of your uh, yeah. uh, desire to express your disgust and so on. You occupy the building, you make it impossible for the uh, commencements to take place or for the students to... Yeah. And, yeah. you know, that that is not something that I would endorse, uh, frankly. And uh, I think it makes the communication of the message, the moral message, uh, garbled by in effect, handing um, people on the other side of their argument a, a ready-made excuse to to dismiss you or to suppress you. Yeah. So, I, uh, yeah, I would distinguish there. I, I am broadly uh, in agreement with that. I would distinguish more between uh, protesting, including uh, uh, some, you know, occupation of a part of a building that's in violation of rules and disrupting the functioning of the institution. Because there's a bunch of stuff that breaks the rules that doesn't really disrupt the functioning. It doesn't keep people from getting to classes. It doesn't keep commencement from happening. And I would be more, I feel more openness about, you know, respecting a, you know, traditions of uh, protest. Um, and, but when it, when it does disrupt the functioning of the institution, uh, then I don't think it's okay. And I also think that, um, you know, some there, there, you know, there are different kinds of demands that people make when people make demands about the institution taking a position on the issue. I, I had, you know, there are these old University of Chicago principles that were authored yeah. by Harry. Calvin, the Calvin principles. Yeah. Uh, in case anyone wants to look up, it's not it's not C L A C A L V I N. It's K A L V E N, and it's a very short statement and very powerful. And the main idea in the Calvin principles is that a university as an institution is a host of critics. It's a host to critics. It yeah. is not a critic. And institutions shouldn't be taking positions on uh, uh, issues, and so demands that the institution. Extra, I, I think it is it 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 uh, undermines the distinctive function of uh, universities as places that are hosts to critics, and it puts people who ha- it risks putting people who have a view. Uh, as being at odds with the official position of the institution, and that puts pressure on people not to have those positions. I think it's really uh, damaging to the functioning of the institution. And there was too much position taking by a lot of institutions for a number of years. Uh, so uh, when uh, we come to, I think what I'm about to say is true, when, you know, uh, you know, when, when, you know, Claudine Gay and others were testifying and they were saying, you know, look, we, you know, we don't take positions on these issues. The problem was that the Ukrainian Oops. flag was flying over Harvard Yard for a while. I mean, you know, the, that there was the slippage away from the principles of that kind about institutions. Uh, and there was the 2020, uh, uh, George Floyd, uh, yes. post George Floyd, uh, yes. anti racism stuff, and a lot of universities leaders made public statements to that effect. So once you stick your neck out, yeah, I'm a big fan of the Calvin principles for the reasons that yeah. you stated. Yeah. 
I, I got to ask you something. We're running out of time here. Yeah. Uh, I have another uh, meeting sh- shortly. Yeah. Uh, you're a student, were a student of the great uh, political philosopher yeah. John Rawls. Yeah. What did he make? A, a, a proponent of liberal democracy in, in all of its, uh, you know, significance. What did he make of the, do you know, of the Zionist project? What, what did he make of the establishment of a, quote, a Jewish liberal democracy? Did he think that, I mean, don't mean to put you on the spot. Maybe you don't know what no, he thought. I don't know. Did he, did he think that that was incoherent and oxymoron? Um, so, um, I don't know what he thought, um, and I'm embarrassed to say that I've never asked the question that you just asked. It's a perfect, it's an, I, I, I mean no criticism of the question when I say that it's obvious. It's so obvious that I didn't ask myself the, the question, but, um, uh, you know, when, uh, I, I think, um, th- there are maybe two different questions. One is a question about the nature of a just society. And the other is a question about the standard, the political standards that it's acceptable to hold other societies to. Um, and uh, so in, and in particular, creating justice, I think Rawls thought, that's the responsibility of people who live in a society. The responsibility of people in other places, I, Rawls was not uh, happy about lots of intervention, uh, the responsibility of, of other people in other places is not to ensure the justice of societies everywhere. And so there was a kind of a kind of idea of toleration at the level of kind of global international uh, politics. There are some standards, like human basic human rights standards that any place has to live up to, and that it's okay for societies to hold other societies accountable to, uh, but not to require that they be just. So I think what Rawls might have thought uh, about um, a, a you know a Jewish democracy is that there were serious questions about whether that is a just society on according to his conception of justice, which he thinks is the right conception of justice. But uh, he didn't think that. Uh, it was the business of other places to say you need to be just. And he got beaten up by a lot of, in, this is in the 90s, he got beaten up by a lot of, you know, quote, liberal internationalists, unquote, who thought, you know, no, it's just, you know, you hold everybody accountable to the same standards uh, everywhere and you're just making excuses for authoritarian regimes, but uh, not, I don't mean that Israel is an authoritarian regime, although in parts it is, and I agree with Jimmy Carter, it has this apartheid quality to it, but I would, but, uh, so I, I think it, w- w- here we are sitting in the United States and the question of what our standards should be for Israel are different from the question of what the standards of people in Israel should be for Israel. And that's just a general truth about any, uh, for any society. Does that even make sense, Glenn? I, it was a lot of words and uh, pretty abstract. No, it does make sense. A theory of justice, which is an intra-societal reflection about uh, having established a state, what people owe to each other, versus yes. a, a theory of empire or of international politics, <laughs> Yeah, uh, which is right. a, on a different uh, plane altogether. I see that's the right. I mean, the law of peoples was Rawls's book about you know kind of international or global politics, and theory of justice was about uh, a a, a uh, an ongoing society, a society where people share a a set of you know 
in uh, a set of uh, institutions. And there were people who the you know kind of cosmopolitan. There was a strong tradition of cosmopolitanism that grew up in the '90s and into the early 20th, uh, 21st century. And the cosmopolitans didn't like uh, this bifurcation that Rawls had between you know, ju- standards of justice for an ongoing society with a set of institutions and what the proper standards were at the global level. I think there was a lot of uh, wisdom uh, in that. And in fact, I once wrote a paper in this spirit about whether there's a human right to democracy. And the first, uh, the first sentence in the paper was, no. <laughs> I mean, literally, that was it. Yeah. It said, no, well, you, it's not. You did not bury <laughs> the lead on that one. No. no. Okay, Josh, thanks for your time. So this is uh, Glenn Lowry signing off. I've uh, been talking with Josh Cohen of uh, Berkeley Law School and Apple University, an old friend, a uh, distinguished political philosopher, and a wise man. And I learned thanks, something, Glenn. Josh, which is that there's a flip side to the self censorship uh, uh, issue, which is. Uh, does the speaker have enough trust in his audience to take a chance uh, rather than to anticipate that he's going to be uh, blasted for having a, a wayward yeah. opinion? That's interesting. It, 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 it's a question. And, and thanks for your time, Glenn. And also, and I, 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 I want to just take the occasion to say this. Thanks for being you. I mean, you make, you're, aside from being a good friend and a wonderful uh, person, you make a really fantastic Uh, contribution in everything you do. And I'm really, like a lot of other people, I'm really deeply grateful for it. I appreciate hearing that, Josh. Take care. Okay.